today before we begin the regular class we will have an active discussion on some of the points raised by some interested students who have been following these classes attending these classes for the last several months <coughs> so i shall take up some of these topics raised in these questions one after another and if there is any need for clarification you can ask again now in this text mandukya upanishad and its commentary on the text that is called kairika we have been trying to explain some of the fundamental principles of non dualistic philosophy which is in sanskrit it's called advaita vedanta the philosophy of advaita which primarily teaches the unity and oneness of existence the unity and oneness of creation in short it tells tells us the fundamental principle that we are one with the supreme reality beyond this body this mind this intellect there is a supreme consciousness immanent residing in all beings and that immanent reality is also the omnipresent or pervading reality it doesn't say other views are wrong it says this is the ultimate goal of spiritual and metaphysical evolution of humanity that is the idea of unity and oneness the idea of non difference now in spiritual life not only in vedantic tradition but generally speaking in all religious traditions spiritual traditions you find a gradual evolution growth from many to one at the beginning of our spiritual life we may think that god is sitting somewhere after creating all of us closely watching our actions our behavior ready to reward for our good actions and punish for our bad actions this is not wrong but vedanta says there is a higher concept of the supreme reality now in this concept which i referred to god world and human beings or created beings they are three entirely different ontological entities ontology is the science of being existence human beings or living beings form one group the big, these living beings are endowed with consciousness in sanskrit it is called chit we are coming to that because uh, some of the students have raised a question about the philosophy of qualified monism which is called visishta advaita of ramanuja and the philosophy of no philosophy of dualism pluralism which is attributed to madhva and also vedanta advaita vedanta of shankaracharya so as i mentioned earlier at the beginning of our spiritual life we follow certain rituals we go to a church a synagogue or a temple or a mosque we worship on a specified day we follow certain rituals we read a book and when we read that we think we have done something we are there in a great spiritual practice true that's right nothing wrong in that on a special day we must fast we should not eat food we must meditate on special on certain periods auspicious days we should read a book with a sense of sanctity the great uh, 
with, with great faith and concentration. These are very important. Otherwise, we cannot please God because God is sitting somewhere outside of creation. That means there is a distinction and difference between creation and creator. This is the beginning of metaphysical and spiritual evolution. This is the first stage, the stage of dualism. In Vedantic tradition, there are three main schools of philosophy and spiritual tradition. And this one which I mentioned, which I refer to now, belongs to the school of Madhvacharya, who came last among the three great Vedantic philosophers, namely Shankaracharya, Ramanuja and Madhva. Now, according to this school, God is different from his creation. And his creation is divided into two categories, the living beings, human beings, animals, and so on, and also the non-living, so-called non-living beings, the rocks, mountains, San Francisco Bay, valleys, forests, and so on. Now, according to this school of philosophy, each individual is different and distinct from each other individual. And each entity in this phenomenal world is different from each other entity. And God is different from all human beings and God is also different from this phenomenal world. Now, there are five sets of differences. In other words, this school of philosophy is the beginning of one's spiritual life. So wherever in life, wherever you find, oh, his, it is his way, my path is different. He is the other one, the idea of the other. The idea of the alien, the idea of somebody being a stranger. The idea of something totally different and distinct from others. That is the beginning, not the highest reach of spiritual life. In fact, uh, you can see here the picture of Holy Mother. One of Holy Mother's most important advices to spiritual seekers was this. Don't see the other. Consider everyone as belonging to you. So this kind of belongingness, this kind of unity, the total absence of otherness is the highest reach in spiritual life and that is possible only in non-dualism. In fact, that's the philosophy we are, we are being trying to expound on the, base, on the basis of this text, Mandukya Kariga and Upanishad. But before reaching this level of unity and oneness and identity with the whole creation, at the beginning of our spiritual life, people sometimes start with differences. So there are five sets of differences. Difference between God and human beings, difference between God and the phenomenal world, Difference between human beings and the phenomenal world. So total three, two more. Difference between different entities in the phenomenal world and difference between different human beings. So it is based on the concept of five differences which is technically called in the dualistic philosophy of Dvaita Vedanta or the dualist, dualistic Vedanta. It is called Pancha Bheda Siddhanta means the doctrine of five differences. This is not the highest goal of human evolution. This was not what Swami Vivekananda preached in America. What Swami Vivekananda brought to this country was the philosophy and the spiritual message of unity, oneness of creation, existence. Beyond and behind 
geographical, cultural, linguistic, sociological, and anthropological differences. There is the underlying unity of oneness, and this oneness is built upon the the fundamental principle of the spiritual unity of existence. Behind all these differences, there is the supreme consciousness, Atman, which is immanent in all beings, which is omnipresent. Now, this is the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. Now, the question that is put to me focuses on the philosophy of Ramanuja and the philosophy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Baladeva. For those of you who are not familiar, because the questioner is familiar with these systems of philosophy, maybe not all of you, but I shall try to give a brief introduction. Now, from this lowest level of a philosophical tradition, a spiritual tradition based on differences and distinctions, to the highest level of unity and oneness, which are taught in non-dualistic philosophy of Shankaracharya, there are different levels, different phases in spiritual and metaphysical evolution. The philosophy of Ramanuja and the philosophy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu belong to these various levels of evolution, beginning with dualism and reaching the highest non-dualistic philosophy. So as I said, we begin with differences and then we proceed towards the ideal of non-difference. But before we, we reach that stage, there are various phases and levels of unity and also differences. Ramanuja philosophy. Ramanuja was born in 1017 AD and passed away in one, 1137 AD. He lived for 120 years. He was a married man. Later he became a monk. He was a very devoted person, a great philosopher, a great writer, a great scholar. According to him, and that is the first question that is raised here. So according to him, the ultimate reality or God is endured with innumerable, indescribable qualities, attributes, uh, power, glory, majesty, and so on. He is the one responsible for the creation of the world, preservation of the world, and also the dissolution of the universe. So Ramanuja describes his God as Sagala Kalyana Guna Niti, which means this is a reservoir of all possible conceivable attributes that we can think of, like power, glory, majesty, goodness, grace, and so on. And this God has a definite form, certain well-structured attributes, as in name, the name is some Ramanuja is called Vishnu, Narayana is the name of that God, which is an embodiment of Vishnu. He lives in Vaikuntha, in a divine celestial ex level of existence. And Ramanuja's philosophy combines the, I, the two con apparently contradictory ideals of unity and difference. There is unity because Ramanuja believes that this created world, the phenomenal world, the empirical world, which is devoid of consciousness, and all living beings which are endowed with consciousness live within the body of this God with names and attributes. And God himself evolves into the living beings, which he called jivas, and also the phenomenal empirical, which he called jagat, which means the rocks, mountains, trees, etc., which are not endowed with 
consciousness. So they live within the body of God. So the example is if we can think of a fruit, inside the fruit you find flesh, seeds and so on. So they, in a way, they are not different from God because they live within God, but they are not the same as God. So there is a inherent, inexplicable relationship between the living beings and God. That relationship is built upon this principle of Unity qualified by an idea of distinction or difference. So we call it Vishishta Advaita. It is, no, is non-dualism, but it is qualified by these two aspects. All living beings which are endured with consciousness. They, they live, they reside inside the body of God with name and form and characteristics and also the created world. So, we are not one with the supreme reality, as Advedin say, but we are not entirely different because we are completely, our existence, from an ontological point of view, our existence is completely dependent upon God. We are not independent because we are completely dependent upon but that doesn't make that doesn't mean that we are identical as advaitin say we are different so this is the philosophy of ramanuja this is the first part of the question so it is technically called qualified monism it is monism it is non dualism but it is qualified they are conditioned or uh, it, 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 it is it is conditioned by these two entities which live within, which reside within God, which are certainly not identical with God, but which are certainly not independent from God. They do not have independent status, ontological status, as Madhva say. See, dualists will tell you that every entity is different from every other entity. So everything has got its own independent ontological status. But Ramanuja doesn't say that. He says everything has got an existence, but ontologically it is not independent of the existence of God. This is Ramanuja's philosophy. Now, the next question is uh, with regard to Bheda, 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 Bheda philosophy. It is, it is technically called Achindya Bheda, Bheda. That is the system of philosophy. It is not. It was, in fact, uh, it constitutes the essence of the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who came sometime in the 16th century, who was a great devotee. He was a teacher of philosophy of devotion. And he believed that Krishna is the supreme Godhead. His philosophy, in some respects, is similar to the philosophy of Ramanuja, but only in certain respects, not certainly not identical. His philosophy, as I said, is called Achinde Bheda Bheda. This is a technical term. We may call it inconceivable oneness and difference. Or you can say, that is, God is simultaneously one with and at the same time different from his creation. That's the idea. And this relationship is called inconceivable. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a great philosopher and a great devotee. So, the one point that he made out again and again in his teachings was that, that we cannot judge or measure the glory and greatness of the Lord. Now, this philosophy was expounded by a great philosopher who was a follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His name was Baladeva. 
he wrote a great commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, which is called Brahma Sutras. The commentary was known as Govinda Bhashya, means the commentary, the technical exposition of the philosophy of inconceivable oneness with difference was expounded in this technical work. Of course, at the very beginning, we must keep in mind uh, to what does this term relate in terms of metaphysical or philosophical speculation. The idea is this. The relationship between God and the world, which includes living beings and also the empirical phenomenal world. What is that relationship? That is the idea of speculation. So he says, God is one with his creation, but also different from his creation. Now, how does he expound it? <clears throat> we will see that. He says, God is the cosmic person with a paramatman. We may call it super soul, as they call it sometimes. Whatever we can see or understand and conceive or perceive in this world, is already completely perceived by God. We can never fully understand, we can never fully realize anything in this world except with God's grace. Now, <clears throat> so their, their theology is not pantheistic, but at the same time, it denies the separate existence of God in his own personal form from his creation. I mean, the creation has no independent status. The, what is the major difference between Ramanuja philosophy and, and Achinta Bheda Bheda philosophy? I have already explained Ramanuja philosophy because once I explain that, it will be easy for anyone to grasp the implications of Achinta Bheda Bheda. Because Achinta is a technical term which means inconceivable, beyond description, beyond uh, intellectual perception. Ramanuja believes that all the living beings in the world and also the empirical world reside within the body of God. Just as seed and flesh all reside within the fruit. The fruit means the outer shell, the peel, the flesh, the seed, everything. In other words, God includes all this. God evolves. Through evolution, God becomes all this. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not teach he doesn't say that God evolves into all these beings. All these beings exist by the grace of God. So God presents himself in this world as his cosmic manifestation. But creation is never separate from God because, because whatever God creates cannot exist independent of God. In that sense, there is an element of unity and oneness. But at the same time, God's glory, God's majesty and greatness make him completely distinct and different from his creation. So you can see difference and also similarity. Similarity is there. The relationship is there. Because nothing and nobody can exist without God. God's grace. Nothing in this world has got an ontological status independent of God. At the same time, nothing can be identified with God Himself. <clears throat> now, what? Now, I shall try to find out some of the major differences between Chaitanya's philosophy and Advaita. In Advaita philosophy, those who are been listening to classes for the last nearly 18, 19 months may already be familiar with the idea of indescribability. 
is anirvachiniyata. The technical term is anirvachiniyata. Means we will say that ultimate reality, Brahman or Atman, is beyond description, beyond explanation, beyond verbalization. Because anything that you want to explain in words should satisfy certain conditions. I will explain these five conditions of verbalization. It is common in metaphysics. Aristotle reduces that five to four, that's all. The five conditions of verbalization, anything that you want to explain in words, needs any or all the five conditions. One is that it should be something that you already are familiar with. See, if somebody asks you, I saw something, how, what is it like? You would say, it is like the sun. Nobody will ask you, what is sun? No. Sun is obvious. So if you tell somebody, what I saw is very similar to sun or moon or sky, it becomes obvious. It is called Dravya, it is called Pratyaksha Siddha, obvious. Then suppose you have seen a person, you try to explain who's, who is that person, he is a... He's a uh, is an engineer, you can say. So you explain him in relation to what he does. His job is to do the job of an engineer. He's a mechanic and so on. Another person you want to explain, he is my father or uncle. So there you explain that person in terms of a relationship. Or he's a musician in terms of an act that he's doing. And sometimes you you explain an animal. What is it's a mammal? So there you try to explain an object on the basis of a genetic group to which it belongs. You may where well, I saw a flower. What is the flower? What, what, how, how is it? It's a, it is a blue flower or yellow flower, red flower. So you explain the flower in relation to its quality. It is red in color. So these are the five conditions of verbalization. Advaita Vedanta, non-dualistic philosophy, tells you that Brahman or Atman can never be explained. It can only be experienced. It is beyond description, definition, explanation, or verbalization. Because it doesn't have any of these five conditions of verbalization. Now, the question may arise to understand better the philosophy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Baladeva was the author of the famous book which he wrote. It's called the, it's a commentary on the Brahma Sutras, Vedanta Sutras. It's known as Govinda Bhashin. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself must have written a book, but that is not available now. So his follower wrote this work. Now, here the word is there, Achinde Bheda Veda, means inconceivable. He says, according to this philosophy, the relationship between God and this created world is something which is simultaneous and inconceivable. God is simultaneously similar to and different from his creation. This is the idea. So it is called inconceivable. This inconceivability, it is not the same thing as the indescribability of non-dualistic philosophers. Because in non-dualism, Vedantins teach that this world is, from an ontological point of view, it is different from the supreme reality, Brahman. Brahman is the only ultimate reality. This world is not absolutely unreal, but it is not absolutely real as Atman or consciousness or Brahman. It is only relative. It is subject to changes. It comes into existence. It exists. It grows. It evolves. It decays. And it dies out. So 
it belongs to time, space, and causation. It belongs to relativity. So it is not absolutely real. So in Vedanta, non-dualistic philosophy, the idea of indescribability relates to the ontological status of the universe. But according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the world is real. Everything in this world is real. There is no, uh, the, there is the, the, the view that the world is only relative is not acceptable to the philosophy of Ajinta Bheda Bheda. So that's why I have completed the first part of the question. The second part of the question is related to Sri Ramakrishna's Vijnana, special knowledge of the Absolute by which one affirms the universe and sees it as the manifestation of Brahman, the wax garden example that you often refers to. So this is a question uh, related to the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. But Sri Ramakrishna uh, speaks of the word Vijnana. <coughs> okay, now the word Vijnanam uh, was used in this sense by Sri Ramakrishna, perhaps for the first time. Because every great spiritual teacher uh, interprets the eternal truths, spiritual truths, which are eternal, which do not have an origin because they are eternal. Truths can never be created. But every great spiritual teacher may bring in new vocabulary may use new expressions and words uh, according to the demands and needs of his times, his age. Because every great spiritual teacher is in a very junction of the past and the present. In a way, he expounds certain eternal truths which we do not know when they originated. But that old wine is put in a new bottle. Only the bottle and brand name may be new. But the wine, the eternal spiritual truths are eternal. These are, if you want to know the true implication of this idea, you may read Swami Vivekananda's famous lecture, Sages of India. You find the third volume of Complete Books of Swami Vivekananda. Now, Sri Ramakrishna uses the word Vijnana in a sense in which it was not used either in Buddhist philosophy because in Buddhist philosophy, Vijnanam always implied consciousness, life force, mind, and so on. And uh, in Gita and in some other scriptures, Vijnanam was used as, some, as special knowledge. But it was not used in the sense in which Sri Ramakrishna used it. In fact, the idea uh, in which Sri Ramakrishna uh, use this term can be understood if you listen to this quotation. Sri Ramakrishna says, He alone who after reaching the Nitya, the Absolute, can dwell on, in the Leela, the relative, and again climb from the Leela to the Nitya, as ripe knowledge and devotion. Sages like Narada cherish love of God after attaining the knowledge of Brahman. This is called Vijnana. What is Vijnana? It is to know God distinctly by realizing his existence through an intuitive experience and to speak to him in, intimately. In other words, Sri Ramakrishna says that Vijnana is nothing but the intuitive, immediate knowledge, what we call Aparoksha Anubhuti, which is called in Vedanta. So, and once you get this Vijnana, you can live in the eternal consciousness which is called Nitya. In the consciousness that Brahman alone is the reality. In Samadhi state. In the state of perfect, complete identity with the Supreme Brahman. Which is called the state of Nitya, the eternal consciousness. And also you can come down to the relative plane. which is called Leela. Leela in Sanskrit means play sport, but it relates to the relative empirical world. So, those who have reached the highest spiritual experience, 
need not necessarily always remain in that highest state of consciousness. They can come down to the relative plane because even when they consciously come down to the relative plane for teaching the world, they won't lose their supreme experience. At will, they can, tran they can transcend the relative and go back to the supreme nit nitya state. This idea is explained in the traditional books as Jivan Mukti state, the state of liberated while living in this world. Which Sri Ramakrishna himself explains its practical dimension. It's a king who plays the role of a beggar or maybe one of the Hollywood stars playing the role of a, a miserable beggar. He may get a Nobel Prize, sorry, no Nobel Prize, Oscar Award, he may get for playing the role of a beggar. He may look more beggarly. We may, you may feel like giving him one dollar or two dollars. Even those of you who will never pay anything to a beggar may suddenly take out a ten dollar bill and give to, because they play with such perfection. They look more beggarly because they, and they get an Oscar Award. But even while playing so, with such identification, at heart, they never become miserable. Because they know that once they remove the makeup, they can go back to the five-star hotel and stay there. So, even while living in this relative world, the great liberated souls never get bound they are never in bondage. They are not like other beings. Professional beggars may not appear to be so miserable, but they are beggars. In fact, at heart, they feel the misery and the beggarliness. But an Oscar award-winning actor may look more miserable, more beggar-like outwardly, but at heart, he has no problem. He knows that after an hour or two, he'll go back to his five-star luxurious suit. Like that, a liberated soul, somebody, a great spiritual person who has reached the Vijnana state, can always remain in a state of perfect identi identity with the supreme reality, even while living in this world. So Sri Ramakrishna sometimes he creates the state as living in the state of threshold which is Bhava Mukha, where you can at will enter the room and also come out of the room. So this state is called Vijnana. Now, it has its, it has its uh, sanction in the Vedic literature. There is a there is a um, illustration given by which one affirms the universe and sees it as the manifestation of Brahman. Example is given the wax garden example that he often refers to. Well, a Vijnani, a great spiritual person who has reached that level of spiritual experience, even while living in this world, maybe uh, watching the whole drama of human life in all his realities, tragedies and also joys and happiness. He never becomes identified. He can watch this drama of human life as a spectator sitting on the front row of a, gal of a gallery watching the play going on. His own life he can watch as a play being enacted on the stage. This kind of complete detachment. Now, the entire universe for him is a manifestation of Brahman. In Vedanta, there are two approaches, which one is called cosmic approach, the other is called a cosmic approach. At least this is how modern interpretation in English language have tried to uh, interpret. At least in some of my own articles I've used this. Cosmic approach means sarvam khalu idam brahma. This is the meaning. Means the Vedic, Vedantic statement is that in Brahadarni Gopanishad, the idea is this, everything in this world is nothing but brahman itself. 
positive approach. You look at everything all around, whatever you see, cannot be different from Brahman. As I said, the example of the piece of rope and snake, even when you mistake the rope for the snake, what you are doing when you bring light, you start seeing the so-called snake as the rope now. Really, there was no snake. The snake idea is negated in the rope. Similarly, for a Jivan Mukta, for a liberated soul, for a Vijnani, for a person who has reached this ideal of the highest spiritual consciousness, the whole universe appears to be a manifestation of Brahman, like a wax garden. In reality, only wax. All the different flowers, different entities, and different names and forms and shapes. But in reality, it's only wax only. Like the different ornaments you make from the same gold. So this is the cosmic approach. This is equality. The other approach is, it's called neti neti approach. means, I already explained this in the Mandukya Upanishad. Nanta prakyam, na bhish prakyam, nu bhayada prakyam, na prakyam, like that. I already explained the seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad. You find this Atman, this Supreme Consciousness is not the, not the witness that is manifesting during the waking state or dream state or dreamless state, state, etc. You deny all the visible empirical things and ultimately you reach a state where you, there is nothing more yet to be denied, the denier cannot ne, deny himself. You go on neg negating, and ultimately you cannot negate yourself. So all the epistemological tools fail when ultimately you point out to something which is beyond description. This is called the approach. This is called the a cosmic approach, where you deny the uni the physical universe, and ultimately you point to the spiritual reality behind the physical universe. You deny the names and forms, but ultimately you realize the reality, which appears in the for in names and forms. Names and forms are unreal. The magic is unreal. The magician is real. That's the idea behind it. So this is called the cosmic approach. So Sri Ramakrishna's description of what one really experiences at this state can be compared to this. Now, if you want to get a clearer picture, you read the gospel, you can see the example of a great spiritual person, a wandering monk, a city who came to the temple where he was living, Dakshineshwar. And, you know, he was always dancing. He was always watching. He was looking at the river, he was looking at the garden, the flowers, the temple, the sky, the moon, the clouds, and then say, how wonderful, how wonderful. Everything in this world for him was an expression of the divine. So we are at that state. If the same ascetic, when he sits in meditation, his mind completely withdraws itself from all these empirical manifold phenomena. Then he denies all this and the mind goes inward to the Supreme Atman. That is the cosmic approach. So for a man or a woman, I would say, who has reached this highest level of spiritual experience, there is nothing in the world it doesn't remind him, it does not remind him of God or her God. Everything is nothing but. It points out a higher reality behind. The pluralistic world is a pointer to the, to the unifying thread behind the manifold pluralistic, dualistic universe. So the wax garden, everything is a wax garden. If you don't remember that everything is made of wax, then each shape and each form may appear to be different from each other shape and form. But when you remember it's all made of wax only, you think of only wax. You see only wax. 
सो लिबरेट स्पिरिचुअल पर्सन मे लिव इन दिस वर्ल्ड मे फेस ऑल द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ दिस वर्ल्ड बट ही इज नवर शेकन he can look at his own life with all his problems and miseries still laugh at the whole play that is ultimately what human life means but a man who is bound man or woman for the matter is bound he weeps when something unfortunate happens he cries or he may jump with joy when something he gives momentary pleasure happiest to him is shaken is like a tiny boat that is tossed about in the waves of fate or destiny or karma that's the idea behind so that much so i have answered all these questions because wait, wait please wait a minute i, I shall give you just now uh, there are two sets of questions the first set of questions have been completed then i shall take up the second set of question because we have not had any interaction for the last several months no please please ask me please please you want to ask please so is there an in between state of uh someone who may see the divinity we we've heard of someone who sees only divinity or someone who sees only the relative state is is a black and white in this world is there a gray in that matter is there someone who is partially evolved who truly sees some divinity mm-hmm. and some relativity simultaneously yes yes those who uh, are different phases of spiritual evolution between these two extremes when they meditate when they read the scriptures when they listen to these ideas suddenly they are reminded and highly impressed by by the spiritual truths but again the mind may relapse to a different lower state but this constant practice of listening reading contemplation will strengthen the positive attitude and ultimately that seeker will reach the it's a higher and higher level of living in this state of higher spiritual consciousness so any spiritual practice meditation discussion of these ideas reading of these ideas listening to these ideas contemplating on these ideas not necessarily introspection meditation but even much grosser spiritual practices will reinforce and will take us to a higher slightly higher level and take us away from this state of i mean the lower extreme point towards the higher extreme point any spiritual practice for that's the purpose of discussion reading and all that so Uh, that's why when we meditate when we read suddenly we feel a great sense of joy and but then that that may be short lived again we relapse back but then if we continue this practice then the instances of going back relapsing to the the lower extreme lower st- stage can be reduced and we will find without our being aware of it we'll find our self moving inch by inch forward that's the it's i'm am i clear yes. now i will take up the next question <clears throat> first question is we quite often hear statements so see that the scriptures only point to the supreme knowledge the light is always the and the spiritual practices study of scriptures and contemplation on those higher ideas only remove the darkness well the idea is this um, see vedanta ultimately teaches us that experience is the is the only absolute this is the ultimate goal or spiritual destination this idea behind but we must remember we cannot proceed forward without lifting our mind gradually to a higher and higher level of spiritual consciousness in fact this question is related to the second question so i shall 
read a second question as well. One may be coming to classes and lectures and pujas and meditation for 10, 20, 30 years. But if we do not change our way of thinking and more importantly, the way we behave, then study of scriptures and going to the classes is voided. So, unless these scriptural ideas are taken seriously and one changes their way of life, the value of all the studies are almost non-existent. Is this correct? The, this, in fact, these three, four questions, they constitute one single theme. So that's why I'm going to read the next question. If the samskaras are accumulated through various births direct to, I mean, which, di which constitute a human character and personality, when there are personality conflicts of friction in work relationships, could we say that it's only one set of samskaras fighting against another set? If we say I am propelled by my samskaras, I mean tendencies, inherited tendencies, inherited characteristics, natural psychological drives, so to speak. How does developing willpower or consciously changing the samskaras to become better or more sattvic come into the picture? Please explain. <clears throat> now first we have to remember, uh, though we all inherit accumulated tendencies and impressions from previous life, and they do constitute what we call human character, which in its turn determines our thoughts and also our actions. Still, we are not helpless victims under the tyranny of samskaras or tendencies. I shall try to explain this. Because ultimately, human, some human character, human uh, samskaras or tendencies are related to a complex mechanism There is a re reference to rebirth and accumulated samskaras. So that needs a little explanation. What are we after all? We know very well we are not these physical bodies. And we are not even psychological, psychophysical mechanisms. All spiritual seekers do agree that there is something beyond the body, beyond the mind, beyond intellect, which is our true nature. All serious spiritual seekers do agree on this point. Then what is the role of the so-called human character? And in what way does it relate to the Supreme Consciousness, Atman? Does Atman undergo reincarnation? If not, what undergoes reincarnation? Who accumulates the tendencies and samskaras? See, sometimes we do and we think, we speculate certain things. We don't know why, why and how. We won't be able to trace its influence to any of our experiences in this life. We can't help behaving in a particular manner. We can't help it. And we cannot trace the origin. We cannot explain these tendencies in the light of any action or behavior or experience that we had in this life. So we believe that it comes from some other source. And what is the other source? We may have done certain things which ultimately may have created these tendencies, not in this life, at some other point of our existence, previous life. That's the explanation. So who, who accumulates these tendencies. What are we ultimately? That's what I'm trying to deal with now. <clears throat> now in Vedanta, we believe there is, there is such a thing as the subtle body, the sukshma sharira. That body, the subtle body, is not a visible entity that we see with our eyes, it, it travels through this evolution, this process of endless lives, rebirth, through a particular mechanism. 
and these tendencies and impressions are transmitted through a mechanism which is called in sanskrit sukshma sharira it called puryashtakam that's a sanskrit term don't worry about that i shall try to explain puryashtakam means a vehicle which has got eight compartments let us think of a train with eight compartments what are the eight compartments the first compartment is the five vital energies the movement of the breath the air the five vital air it's called pancha prana in sanskrit the five vital energies the five vital air the second one is <clears throat> the five subtle elements the third unit the five senses of perception the fourth unit is the five senses of action the fifth unit it it has got four components intellect mind memory system is called chittam or ahankaram the ego system the sixth one is ignorance the seventh one is desire and eighth one is karma action i have, you you may have just listened to the sanskrit sounds i shall try to explain now let us say suppose we have done something maybe 1000 years back maybe uh, maybe 9th century ad and maybe we had done lot of spiritual practices so it influences our actions and thought currents today if you believe in the law of karma and law of rebirth you have to admit this now how does it really happen whatever we do consciously with intensity and identification i am doing this this is something which i am involved in whatever we do with that perfect identity any kind of conscious action will leave its mark in our mind there is no doubt about it in fact a set of the one particular unit the fifth unit is called antakaranam in sanskrit we call the internal organs of which <coughs> i will use only mind i don't want to go into those details mind mana buddhi chitta ahankara four compartments i shall use the word mind to make it simple now if you have done some good actions maybe 1000 years back that action if you have done sincerely it has left its impression in our mind suppose we have we are listened to a wonderful spiritual idea exposition of a great spiritual idea we have listened with our uh, with our ears and our mind mind and ears and coming together we listen and when we listen with great concentration it's never lost it is left it's uh, it, it leaves a mark in our uh, memory system it's called chittam after 1000 years you may be born in a country or a society or a place where there is no real scope for any kind of spiritual practices but accidentally if you go pub, you visit a public library you happen to see a spiritual work a book or you happen to listen to scriptural great spiritual lecture suddenly our mind is drawn to us that 1000 years have gone you have heard with your ears 1000 years back the years do not exist because it was burnt physical years of course burnt or vanished with your body and the mind with which you listen to those ideas 1000 years back apparently that mind doesn't exist but the tendencies that you accumulated a thousand years back remains intact if the tendency is something positive and helpful in spiritual life then the mind is suddenly turned towards similar spiritual ideas 
even after a thousand years, two thousand years. That's how we suddenly get drawn towards certain <coughs> ideas which we have no way of explaining in terms of our experience in this life. In Gita, to make this point clear, in the sixth chapter of Gita, Arjuna puts a very interesting question to Krishna. Very practical question. After listening to a long discourse, Arjuna asks a very simple question. No, Lord Krishna, I want to ask you one question. What about those who start their spiritual life, make some progress, and then fall by the wayside, may face a fall in spiritual life, forget all about it? Don't you think it is complete or everything is lost? Ayadi Sadhayope do Yoga Chalidamana Saka Aprapi Yoga Sam Siddhim Kam Gadim Krishna Gitchadi. This is the question for those who are interested in the sixth chapter. In answer to this, Krishna answers Look here, whatever noble good things you do, even for a day, even if you meditate your whole life for half an hour, you seriously read a good holy book and contemplate and seriously understand idea. It leaves its mark on the memory system, in the chitta, its mind, and in the next life, when you get an opportunity to get access to similar spiritual ideas, your mind will automatically be drawn towards that. That's what Krishna says. The good tendencies and impressions that you have gathered once in life will leave its positive influence. It will never be lost. In fact, this question on the part of Arjuna provokes a very great promise from Krishna. He says, so the question is this, this Ayadi Sadhayo Pedu Yoga Chalidamana Saka Aprapi Yoga Sam Siddhim Kam Kadim Krishna Gechati Kachinno Bhavi Brashta Chinna Bhavana Siddhi Apadishto Mahabhahu Vimudhu Brahmanat Padim. In answer to this, Krishna answers Naki Kalyana Kritkaschit Durgadim Tata Gechati Partha Naiveka Namutra Vinasa Stasi Vididi this is the promise. The meaning is this. Krishna tells Arjuna, look here, whatever little you have practiced, half an hour meditation, reading a holy book for some time, or any simple unselfish action, even if you don't believe in God, any noble unselfish act on your part, it's a great spiritual practice. It will leave its mark, like the money that you deposit in bank. Afterwards, you can draw a check. Like that, in spiritual bank, you can make a deposit any time, any point of your life. You are never late and nothing is lost. So the least bit of spiritual practice that you do becomes a great a source of help and relief it becomes a spiritual deposit which you can draw upon in the next life. Now what really happens? The question is about samskaras. These samskaras that, we are, that are already accumulated in our mind will remain there. But these samskaras are not tyrants. If there are negative samskaras which are creating, it may create conflicts in our mind. When you sit for meditation, Suddenly, terrible thoughts, undesirable ideas, imageries, images may spring up. Maybe the result of some non-spiritual tendencies we have accumulated. They can be countered by positive actions. Immediately, one can read a holy book. A negative thought can be strongly countered and made positive with the help of positive thought currents. 
So we are not uh, slaves uh, of samskaras. Samskaras do not become tyrants. If bad samskaras can create problems, good samskaras can help us come out of them. And we can consciously do good things. So samskaras or tendencies do not make us helpless toys in the mighty waves of destiny. It is not fatalism. It is not accidentalism or fatalism. So, we have already taken enough time. We will continue answering these questions in the next class. Already. <coughs> so, I will continue the, this discussion in the next class. So, <coughs> no thank you. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Dasar Sivam Vishnu